You need to grow up. Grow up? I'm 38 years old. It's time to put some respect on Flapjack's name. It is not often that a single cartoon has such a massive and long-lasting impact on the entire cartoon industry. Sure, you have the classic genre-defining cartoons. Powerpuff Girls, Spongebob, these were all massive successes that changed the industry forever. We know these classics, but there's one show that quite literally created the entire world of cartoons today. And that show is The Marvelous Misadventures of Flapjack. Guys, this is the story of how Flapjack changed everything. The year is 2001. After graduating from CalArts, the cultiest school in animation, Thurb Van Orman found himself landing a job at Cartoon Network. Working in the animation industry, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, Thurp had an idea. Pulling from his own childhood living in Panama City, Florida, Thurp reflected on an old fantasy he had of living on a dock and going on adventures. Quote, when I was 14, I wanted to spend the summer on an island just off the coast, living off the land for three months. I wasn't even going to bring a pocket knife. I was going to make everything I needed out of shells and eat raw sea urchins and stuff like that. I, I love this man. All of these ideas culminated in the perfect creative storm, creating a cartoon concept that he dubbed The Marvelous Misadventures of Flapjack, a show about a small boy and a captain living in the mouth of a whale, of course. He took his big ideas to the execs at Cartoon Network, he went in front of them and with all his heart and soul pitched his dream, and got rejected. According to Thurup, the pitch went actually pretty awful. They didn't take me too seriously. The person I pitched to was watching TV while I pitched. Even though they acted like they had notes and stuff, I realized no one would take me seriously until I had some experience. Not letting this setback dissuade him from making Flapjack a reality, Thurup took this as a learning experience and got back to work. The most crucial thing he got out of this whole process was feedback. And he listened to all of that feedback, took it to heart. He needed more experience before he could pitch again, so that's exactly what he got. According to him, I started going to Powerpuff story meetings, and then they started buying ideas from me. I worked really hard those first two years to make a name for myself, doing storyboards on Powerpuff Girls, Grim Adventures of Billy and Mandy, Camp Laszlo. As soon as I started making an impression, people realized there was this new person here who had some new ideas. That's when I pitched Flapjack again. Instead of letting the first failed pitch discourage him, Thur picked himself back up and took it all to heart. He worked twice as hard to make a name for himself, and when he finally had the experience of a seasoned cartoonist, around the year 2003, he went back and re-pitched Flapjack, and the studio said yes. <laughs> When Thurp got the pitch, he began to get to work, and show running was a lot of work. After spending some years in development, Flapjack finally premiered in 2008. The show was a tour de force in animation. The whimsical adventures about a boy named Flapjack and his best friend and role model Captain Knuckles living in the mouth of their whale Bubby and going on adventures in search of a magical candy island seems like so much on paper already. However, it wasn't the show's concept that pulled viewers in, but the writing, tone, and overall surrealness of the show's humor. Flapjack was just so weird and so genuinely funny that anyone watching couldn't stop. The show wasn't afraid to get dark and borderline disturbing when it had to, and it was great. On top of the incredible storytelling and writing, Flapjack was monumental in terms of animation. The show employed a ton of mixed media, frequently including stop motion segments and bits to enhance the charm of the show. Like its sister show Shouter, stop motion was done at Screen Novelties, a company out in Hollywood. Ever passionate and ever hardworking, Thurp was known to often go down and animate scenes himself. If you're not convinced of how passionate he is to his craft, he even handmade the puppets in the theme song. According to him, the opening animation is done with real wood carved puppets. I carved almost all of them, and the wooden letters at the top of the show myself when we were doing the pilot, mostly because we didn't have any budget. I could gush about Flapjack for hours, and I will, but it mostly boils down to raw passion. To pull from Flapjack's theme, a good cartoon is often like a ship, a crew of people working exceptionally hard to keep something afloat, and every good ship needs a captain. Thurup was one of the greatest captains in the industry. The show's fan base grew quickly, especially on the internet, and he was often known to reply to fan art on DeviantArt and other web-based services, which only helped the fan base grow bigger and bigger. It's hard to analyze and put into words why Flapjack was so great, I guess at the end of the day I would just say to go watch an episode and see for yourself. But if I were really going to try, I would point to the Emmy winning episode, Sea Legs. This episode perfectly encapsulates everything that made Flapjack Flapjack, and it literally won an Emmy, so I'm not the only one that liked it. Oh my goodness, Bobby, what is that? Oh my. 
The first thing to note, and something I'll touch on later in this video, is the list of people that worked on this episode is incredible. Pendleton Ward, JG Quintel, Alex Hirsch, they all had a hand at some point either boarding or story directing this episode. And you can tell, for the three of these creators to work together now would be nearly impossible. So to see the three of them work together retroactively is really just a treat, and is honestly incredible. The story opens with Bubby and Flapjack singing to a fish, trying to convince a fish to be their friend. This perfectly showcases Bubby and Flapjack's nurturing relationship, and it's a sweet start to the episode. But like any Flapjack, Jack plotline, it gets really weird really fast, and they bump into a giant pair of legs floating on a raft. Now, this is a bizarre concept and a weird turn for the story, but Flapjack's youthful enthusiasm and general curiosity helps the viewer adjust a little bit to the weird situation. He excitedly gets Captain Knuckles and decides that he really wants to help the legs find his owner. Knuckles is lazy at first, but eventually, Bubby makes him comply with a good amount of slapstick humor. This clip right here perfectly depicts their character dynamic. Flapjack's first instinct is to help. Knuckles doesn't want to, he's lazy, but Bubby keeps him in check. Together, the three of them are the perfect trio. The episode spirals out of control when Flapjack convinces Knuckles to wear the legs in order to help him find the owner. The visual of Knuckles with giant legs is hilarious on its own, but Flapjack's tendency to steer into the surreal makes the entire concept just that much more hilarious. When they head back to Stormalong Harbor, Knuckles gets greedy with the legs and starts wreaking havoc all across town, much to Flapjack's dismay. It's not until he has a spiritual conversation with a fish that admits to just being a part of his own psyche and the return of the top half of the horrifying monster and original owner of the legs, the Flapjack learns what he has to do, Knuckles' greediness ultimately backfires in his own face, the legs essentially destroy Stormalong Harbor, and he even ends up losing his original legs, which he insults. This is Flapjack in a nutshell. Flapjack is hopeful and tries to help people, and Knuckles abuses that hopeful energy and ultimately pays for it in the end. It's safe to say that you can see a little bit of Flapjack in a lot of cartoons that came after it, both in how surreal the show was able to get, and also how grounded it was. Flapjack was having a conversation with a talking fish, but the conversation was about empathy and emotion. These grounded and strange concepts ultimately are just hilarious, and it's a style of comedy that will be used far into the future. And that's not a coincidence, but we're gonna get to that in a second. Flapjack was nominated for plenty of awards during its two-year run from 2008 to 2010. The show ultimately got 46 episodes over 91 segments, and honestly what is one of the weirdest endings in all of television. As the decade ended, the story of Flapjack came to an end, and what came after was unprecedented. After Flapjack ended in 2010, we entered a monumental decade for animation, receiving some of the most notorious and influential cartoons of all time, and seeing the animation community blossom and grow into something that's bigger and greater than it's ever been before. 2010 really felt like the start of a golden age, one that hasn't really stopped since, and almost all of the notable cartoons in this golden age were created by Flapjack alumni. Adventure Time, the biggest show of the decade, arguably, definitely a cultural phenomenon at the very least, was created by Pendleton Ward a prominent writer and storyboarder on Flapjack. Its sister show, Regular Show, was another massive success. Regular Show employed that same brand of surreal humor, comedically tied to the monotony of working a minimum wage job, and the show managed to find a huge and passionate audience, both young and old. Regular Show's creator, JG Quintel, was a creative director and writer on Flapjack. Having two prominent cartoon creators come from one show is honestly not that abnormal in the industry. However, seeing those two shows be such massive phenomenons and huge successes is not something that happens often but it gets crazier. Cut to 2012. A storyboarder from the Marvelous Misadventures of Flapjack gets their own cartoon pickup by the House of Mouse of all places. That man's name was Alex Hirsch. Gravity Falls went on to be a phenomenon, one of the quintessential shows of the last 10 years, and is hailed as one of the greatest cartoons of all time. He got his start on Flapjack. He even went back and got his old boss having third voice Lil Gideon, one of the show's main antagonists. <laughs> Think it can't get any crazier? In 2014, we get a miniseries, Over the Garden Wall. Huge critical and commercial success, one of the most beloved miniseries and pieces of animation of all time still loved to this day. That was created by Patrick McHale, a storyboard artist on Flapjack. He even had a Flapjack character cleverly named Punzi McHale, based off of him, as terrifying as he is. Do you see the pattern at this point? It's normal to get a brilliant creator, or even creators, to come out of a show. Steven Hillenberg worked on Rocco's Modern Life before creating arguably the biggest cartoon icon since Mickey Mouse. I mean, creators don't don't just come out of nowhere. They're usually working in the industry before they get their hand at their own show. However, to have this many members of the Flapjack crew go on to create this many prominent cartoons is honestly unprecedented. They all went on to become household names. If anything, the fact that they all worked on the same show at all is, well, marvelous. 
But it was really just the start. I mean, if you're using this logic, you can stretch it even further. Adventure Time gave us Rebecca Sugar, who went on to make Steven Universe. That divided further to give us OKKO OK and Craig of the Creek. Regular Show gave us Owen Dennis and Infinity Train. Gravity Falls led to the Owl House and Amphibia. All of these creators are talented and brilliant, and they all deserve their own show. They worked just as hard. But it's crazy to think that all of these shows, in fact, the entire current landscape of animation, stem from one man's weird fantasy to eat sea urchins on the beach and a whole lot of talent. And guys, that's how Flapjack changed everything. That's all I got, but guys, I really want to know what your opinion is on all of this. Do you agree with me? Is there anyone out there who hates Flapjack and thought it was annoying? Let us know in those comments down below or tweet to us at Roundtable Vids or me at It's Richard Nemo. Let's get a debate going, but like a healthy one, please. If you want to consider helping out the Roundtable, you can support us on Patreon and get access to exclusive scripts and avatars. And as always, if you enjoyed this video, you can make sure you like, share it, and subscribe to the Roundtable for more incredible cartoon content. This is sort of like a new series we're trying out, so hopefully you guys like it. And if you do, make sure to share this video, please. I put a lot of work into it and I'm really proud of it. Alright, that's all for me guys. Uh, I'm Nemo. I'll see you next time. Peace.